what is shell right uh, what we are doing now and if you might have seen some of the press coverage that we have now uh, our vision is very clear our purpose is to power progress together by providing more cleaner uh, energy solutions right so we are targeting lot of powering progress and you know finding clean fuels and you know power uh, powering progress through technology green software i think you must have heard that term as well and underpinned by our core values and our focus on safety so that is shell as a vision we are an energy company but we are looking at the future and how we transition there uh, we are uh, you know uh, as other oil and gas or other major companies are there we are also significantly contributing towards green energy and energy transition i will skip this a uh, lot of fine print there that's for me you know what i should share and what i shouldn't so uh, so i've covered my introduction uh, as i said i am the odd one out mechanical engineer starting something on a shop floor and now uh, in shell it since last 11 years this is my 12th year so how i survived in shell in it you know it's a question for myself as well <laughs> Uh, so, what I am going to talk about today is unstructured data at Shell. So, unstructured data. I think all of us understand what is unstructured data. Eighty uh, percent of our data, and I think that is industry-wide uh, statistic. Eighty percent of the data is unstructured data. Uh, structured data, very clear. A lot of us know how to handle it. We have uh, means and know-how and understanding. of handling the uh, structured data but the challenge is how do we uh, do the same with unstructured data uh, examples are seismic data one of the use case is seismic data for us for uh, any energy company that would be there so a lot of graphs logs photo images and all that are there so how do we interpret it how do we interpret that data and ensure that you know we will have a successful drilling somewhere we will recover or we'll uh, cover oil there so that's where ai and ml is used another use case for this unstructured data is uh, the predictive maintenance so we have all our assets iot right a lot of sensors giving us data uh, people interacting with the equipments and filling out forms failure modes and all that uh, images contracts with companies for maintenance operations all that how do we identify a pattern how do we identify the pattern between the failures of the equipments and the environmental data and the uh, people working on that asset you know how does this impact our performance of an equipment so that's another use case that we deal with now the third one is also contract management we use uh, natural language processing nlp uh, to do better contract management payment terms invoicing fine prints conditions uh, of a particular contract how do we then use nlp and make sure that our uh, contracting is better and where do we leverage this uh, technology so i have some of the statistics that you know according to idc uh, 80% of world's data will be unstructured data in 2025 i uh, right now i think it is more than 80% but it will be around 80% lot of uh, lot of effort is going in there now <clears throat> data quality is another challenge in unstructured data in structured data you have lot of algorithms that you can build to assess the data quality but for unstructured data how do you uh, build data quality dashboards how do you make sure that data governance covers that data quality aspects and and work on it so what we do for example uh, i belong to information management uh, department in it uh, in uh, information data and analytics now information management is a prerequisite to manage unstructured data and also structured data so we deal with taxonomy better the taxonomy better the chances of handling this data uh, so simple example would be so i i worked in iraq 
uh, and I, wo I worked in an upstream field. Now, uh, during this course of, you know, last 11, 12 years uh, throughout my career, I've seen how this kind of things, you know, impact uh, oil and gas operations in a major way. So now when I talk about taxonomy, right? So uh, we name our equipments. MJ42, for example, is a name of a well. Now, my name, let's say, Joban Putra Yagnesh. Yagnesh Joban Putra. Yagnesh Space Joban Putra. Yagnesh Dot Joban Putra. There can be many variations. And when we deal with millions of assets, how do you identify this is the right one? You need the tool to identify that. And the tool will only identify if you have the right rules explained to the tool. So in the algorithms, you need to have that pattern identification. How do you identify that pattern? Now imagine if there are two wells with the same name, MJ42. Oil and gas operations are risky in nature. Uh, a lot of safety issues there. If we bypass that also, for example, an operator has a heart attack in that well and you call the control room saying that my operator has a heart attack, come to MJ42. So emergency response team, where does it go? Which MJ42, right? So the taxonomy plays such a critical role to make sure that, you know, we leverage the data tools and technology that we have. But if you don't do it, before you, you know, implement the algorithms and all, if you don't have the proper pr information management practices, then I think, you know, you will not uh, realize the value or benefit of what all, all of us do in this room. Again, so uh, as I said, you know, good information management practices, they ensure that we identify the valuable information right at the start and the best way possible. No perfect solution yet, but there are a lot of challenges, but then you know, maturity has increased and we are doing a much better job. Uh, again, uh, one of the another statistic that I want to just throw around. Uh, by 2025, uh, the global data sphere is going to grow to 175 zettabytes. 90% of it will be unstructured. Images, documents, text analytics. One of the other example that I wanted to also give where oil and gas companies struggle with is compliance. We have very strict uh, regulatory requirements. We have to retain some of the documents and information for 100 years. Now, uh, how do we do that? How do we identify which information has to be retain, <coughs> retained for what period? Lot of claims, lot of fines, there, uh, so if you must have read in, in the news also, uh, big companies, oil and gas companies, uh, they have this fines from the regulators, uh, billion dollar, two billion dollar, fifty billion dollar, million dollars fine. Now, when such a claim comes, how do we re uh, re uh, retrieve the information that is required to defend our position, right? So. Regularity requirement forces us to retain information, but then how do we do it smartly? So we use uh, uh, AI and ML to do that. So ML specifically for uh, 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 training the uh, training the algorithm to identify the images and and the text. And you know, a lot of uh, content management system nowadays are enabled with text search but that doesn't do the uh, justification. You know? So all the uh, technical know-how that we uh, listened to in the previous presentation is implemented on this kind of scenarios as well. And when we talk about the documents, one asset, one facility that we run would have, let's say, one million documents. So imagine that, you know, Shell is a global company. We are present almost in every country, uh, so many retail sites. How do we then, you know, uh, work out our problem? So a lot of use cases, a lot of problem, problem statements for the IT folks to solve. And that's what we do. There are 10,000 odd people that we have. That's what we do. That's what we solve day in, day out. Another fun fact, just because I... Uh, you know, nearest search. When I was talking about this, something uh, triggered in my mind. Do you know who sells the maximum coffee? 
shelf. It's not Starbucks. So, uh, and if you go to a Shell retail station, please try the coffee. It's fantastic. <laughs> so that's what, uh, again, you know, you can imagine the data sets that we deal with. Uh, the type of, uh, you know, retail stations, I think we have uh, around 1,000 or more. I don't remember the exact numbers. We can get those numbers from the counter. Uh, uh, so we have so many growing uh, retail stations in, in India, in Bangalore, in Karnataka. So again, uh, unstructured data there. Uh, unstructured uh, information then how do we deal with? How do we replicate the design of a retail station with minimum effort? Otherwise, you know, every time we have to spend money on design, construction and commissioning, we also have a lot of digital solutions that we implement on the project execution and construction, but also on the operation side. Okay, uh, so time for another. 71% of organizations now, they consider uh, information management as a critical aspect to uh, leverage the value of digital solutions. Again, I'm just here giving you facts and the use cases, technical questions I will not be able to answer, but the amount of the, uh, so I'm trying to you know emphasize on the problem that we have. And we heard about Walmart and probably Amazon would have the same problem statement. But oil and gas, energy industries, or any manufacturing industries would have that problem multiplied by 10. Somebody like Shell. It's, it's a big, big problem for us. And that's what we do. And that's what we solve. So questions again is, is, is a big problem, right? And normally what we do is, and I, I use this analogy a lot, uh, we kind of mop the floor every time but we don't close the tap. So the quality issues keep on uh, coming. So every six months, every one year, we spend a lot of money and effort in re uh, rejuvenation of the data quality. So the, the eff uh, effort that we put now is uh, on data governance. So when I talk about data governance, what it means is, obviously we have the tools and technology at our hands, but also the uh, data quality teams are established. So taking care of the data quality when the data is generated. And then reviewing, so giving them the monitoring part of it, building dashboards, giving them the, uh, so data democracy by, by the way, giving them access to the data quality dashboards. That helps them realize that, you know, what is missing and, you know, so we have a, uh, organized uh, data governance committees, or we call it as data quality teams at every asset, at every project. And the basic job of these people is to uh, look at the data quality problems that come. So once you learn something, then you have to root it out of the process by finding the root cause and, and, and ensuring that it doesn't happen again. But there is no shortcut for uh, uh, unstructured data for data quality. Yes, please. So, uh, as I said, first, uh, so we have, so you know the control valves. I, I'm not sure if you know that, but control valves are the valves that uh, that controls the fluid in the uh, in the field, uh, in an, uh, for the equipment, for the pumps and whatnot, right? Now we have thousands of control valves. Uh, so failures are there. The data is probably seen or not seen, you know, the IOT, uh, the whole link of IOT, whether is it working or not. So when, uh, and I think uh, you will find it in the internet also, uh, we have collaborated with C3.ai, you know, so all this real time data that we get, they go through an algorithm and we identify patterns and we do predictive maintenance. So identifying the pattern through AI, uh, looking at the historical data and then uh, predicting the future for control walls. And this is just one example, but that similar examples we have in a lot of areas. Basically, the real-time data that we get uh, for production, flow rates, temperatures, pressures, environmental data, 
predicting the pattern there through AI. That's what uh, we do. That is one, but also, uh, you know, optimizing the maintenance, optimizing the production processes. So safety is definitely uh, one of the biggest factor, but optimizing the production and optimizing the maintenance of it. Also, one of the other uh, use cases, uh, so bigger, big facility, so billions of dollars in spares. So we have to keep spares for, for our critical equipment, right? And as I said, the taxonomy is not clear. So you are kind of have duplicate spares. You kind of have functional spares. Using AI and ML, we optimize the spares. How much we spend on spares? Because that's directly unlocking the dollars there. If we are able to reduce, let's say, minimum order quantity by two or three units, then I think it's saving a lot of dollars for us. That's another use case. Yes. Uh, fintech related, I, uh, so according to my experience, yes, on the retail station we do. But what that is, I don't have the visibility to it. But on the retail stations, we deal with the customers directly, right? So payment interface and all. So we do, we have our loyalty program as well. So th there also we have some uh, problem statements and solutions. <coughs> Okay, we still have 10 minutes. Uh, just a question, how many of these data science problems you are talking about different outputs that we are using essentially? So we have data science team across India, Houston, US, Netherlands and UK. 80% of the team is in India. So we solve data science problems uh, we have uh, information data and analytics team in India, data science, uh, and also uh, visualization platforms, data platforms. We work with uh, hybrid cloud, uh, Amazon cloud, Azure cloud, all of that is also there. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. So the USP in Shell is we combine domain with technical knowledge, right? Uh, and this is one of the common questions that is, that is asked to me. What is the difference between you and the pure play IT company? AIML, they are much better there in terms of technology, leveraging technology. Now, when you come to Shell, uh, as I said, the combination of business knowledge and AI, AI ML knowledge is what helps us. Now, any IT professional will tell you that if you have, if you know the business, if you know the end problem, you can do better and you can make a better career out of it. So Shell gives that unique opportunity to the IT career professionals to do both, to understand the business and so whenever you are, for example, uh, she asked about data science team. So we have team here, but they also get travel opportunities and visit the sites, see the problem uh, on their own, you know, and then discuss with the uh, plant operators, discuss with plant maintenance technicians and all, and then contribute towards solving a problem. So we see the impact directly when we solve a problem. Yes. Yes. So, it, for example, uh, if you understand the maintenance strategy, earlier, I mean, the basic one is reactive maintenance. It's when you react to a failure and solve the equipment failure and then uh, make it, you know, uh, in production again. The second one is preventative maintenance. Uh, it means that, you know, uh, Manufacturer will tell you that, you know, grease this pump every two months, every three months. So you have a task list to do every particular recurring frequency. 
then comes predictive maintenance or condition based uh, maintenance so when we have these sensors for example in a pump we will have a vibration sensor and thermal sensor so based on the thermal sensor we will know the heat that is generated if it is generated you know beyond the limit that it is supposed to then you know that something is wrong same with vibrations you know you, there is a, a sp whole field about vibration analysis now merging ai ml with understanding of vibrations and uh, interpreting the data that is coming out of the equipments is where then uh, person sitting in chennai is able to tell somebody in uk uh, aberdeen scotland that your pump is going to fail please take the corrective action now so that's what we are uh, leveraging right now that's what we are doing right now yes please uh, is the topic of this uh, discussion is about data. yes I slightly but i mean it's not as structured as you know you will have that uh, structured databases relational databases not as structured yeah. so from shell point of view what is the most unstructured data in documents documents documents, documents. we have documents so i will tell you you know uh, five six years back I was uh, trying to solve this unstructured uh, data problem for documents, right? And it is all cost. How do you leverage uh, the data out of unstructured uh, formats? 80 million documents not used as they were supposed to be used. Can you give an example of how it's supposed to be used? So, for example, uh, let's say PNID. Uh, if you understand piping and instrumentation, uh, instrumentation diagram, or I can give you examples. So you have lights and switches and everything here. This normally you will have a key line diagram that will tell you that substation is here. The wiring goes from substation to here. These are the switches. These are the uh, panel boxes, junction boxes, and all. Now all this data is in a document. If I have a failure, I have to go and read that document to understand, right, where the failure is. Now, what happens is when you cannot find this document in five minutes, in single click? So, imagine this auditorium has so many halls, so many rooms. And then someone tells you that, okay, if you have a problem in hall B with your, uh, uh, this one. Uh, and then where do you go to find the document? So, you will be given access to an archive where you will have hard copy documents probably uh, 2,000 even, let's say only 2,000. How do you search from that 2,000 which is most relevant for this projector? So that's what we struggle with and one asset, one facility would have more than 150, 120,000 documents. And maintenance engineers and operators and all, that day job is something else. That day job is not looking for information. So, according to one estimate, 55% of your time is wasted in searching for information. And to search unstructured information is the help. So, we, uh, we started from document-centric to data-enabled, and now we are going towards data-centric. Now, when I say data-centric, now you have technology which is so for this PNID diagram or a single line key diagram, you have smart authoring tools, which means the date, uh, these drawings are stored in a database as data elements. So whenever you want to view that, you click a button and it will generate that uh, 2D uh, graphical representation, but the elements are still stored in a database. Sure. Yeah, so, so for example, uh, as I said, the, the sensor will give you the vibration uh, pattern, right? Vibration data. Now, to make sense out of it, to interpret that vibration data, you have to have it in a graphical form and understand the first frequency, second frequency, and all that. There is a science behind it. Now, the sensor that gives you data is not in that format to interpret for yourself. So, it is not... Uns uh, structured in that sense, you have to make an, 
uh, algorithm using AI ML to understand what the sensor is telling you, but also to interpret that sensor data in some other form. It's not as straightforward. So for example, temperature sensor, it will give you readings of temperature at every frequency, right? Uh, but then to make a pattern out of it, make sense out of it, make it stru more structured, you know, because it, it will relate to a pattern of environmental uh, problem as well. So I'll give you one example when I was working in a tire industry, uh, beginning of my career, oil hydraulics. So we had imported equipment from Germany, uh, Austria rather. So second hand equipment. So we imported the equipment there, uh, oil hydraulic power packs, which operates uh, some equipment parts, right? Now, when we imported them, uh, we were using servo system. Uh, so the recommendation was servo system 44, 45 something. And this number, servo system, and then number indicates the viscosity of the oil. Now, uh, Austria is colder. India is hotter. We used the same oil but we were facing a lot of leakages because as the uh, pumps run, the hydraulic system runs, the temperature becomes high and the uh, oil is less viscous, right? Uh, so leakages occur more. So we had to use servo system 68 with a higher viscosity oil in India. We cannot use the manufacturer recommendation which is there in uh, for, for Austria, which is a colder environment. So identifying these kind of patterns is where we use our team, IT team to, you know, again, it works in conjunction with the business, uh, mechanical, electrical SMEs, and they work with the IT teams, and then we come out with the uh, identification of patterns and all. So that's where uh, technology uh, cannot do everything on a standalone uh, way of working. It has to be through uh, partnering with business. Well, uh, see, it's in their best interest to do that, right? Uh, after all, by doing this, we save money. Uh, we build better operations. Our availability of a plant, production is increased. So Shell is invested so much. I mean, go ahead and on LinkedIn, you will find a, a video about this uh, control walls that I talked about. Uh, our VP uh, has, you know, spoken about it, what we have done through uh, artificial intelligence. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, as it is, it's a, it's a profitable business, right? So we have to depend on return on investment. No harm. Okay, so some part we do outsource. But uh, we want to have this knowledge in-house. As I said, we can work with the IT industry, right, outside as well. But the USP that Shell offers to the people is also its, uh, you know, uh, differentiator. People in Shell, understanding technology and business both. That's where you get maximum things solved, resolved. Outsourcing it may be cheaper in the short term, but then if you look at the long term impact, it doesn't stand the same way. Uh, we do have challenges, but uh, as I said, because we have, you know, now it's a machine. So we already have people who, are, so I, as I said, 11 years completed. My colleague here, 14 years uh, in IT in Shell. So, we have that, you know, chain of, of people already there and, you know, transferring the knowledge and making sure that we interact with the business. And we have the, those processes set up where somebody comes in without any business background, they get trained in the domain as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>